Hello, and welcome back. Today we are going to be building a web server from scratch in C. And before we begin, I want to solve the riddle from the previous video. So if we look at my node file here, and I was using this switch statement in order to select which data type the user was trying to use, and I was having problems when I was trying to insert characters, and the problem was simply I forgot my break statement in there. The way that the switch case statement works is that it will check the case, and as soon as it finds the case that fits, it will execute all of the subsequent quick cases until you specify break. So that's what was causing the problem. I simply added my break statement, and there we go. My nodes are now completely dynamic, and they can handle any kind of data, be it an array, a custom data type, a single value, absolutely anything. Okay. So let's start talking about this web server. And I'm going to do this in a similar manner to my C++ version of this, which I have right here. But I want to point something out about what I did in C++ that I'm going to avoid here using C. So C++ is an object-oriented language. And I did something here that is something I try to avoid doing in programming and honestly in life in general. So the problem is when you have a good idea, it's very tempting to use that exact idea for every possible scenario or problem that arises. And in this case, it is objects. So object-oriented programming is great, but it is not appropriate all the time. For instance, look at the language Java. In Java, absolutely everything is and pretty much has to be an object. They go so far as to define an object object. That is a object that represents objects. Okay, no, <laughs> you don't need that. It's, it's, if you take a good idea and you just use it ubiquitously, it's just kind of a mess. And here I have a simple socket object. I have a binding socket object. I have a listening socket object. I have a connecting socket object. I have a server object. I have my test server up. It's just too much. Okay, I just... The, the goal of what I am doing here is to make a generic web server so that anytime I want the behavior of a server, I can just call a single function and get exactly the server I want. And that's what we're going to be doing in C. So I am still going to use some notions of objects in C, but it won't be quite the same. So let's first create a new group. I need to create it in here. Oh, hot corners. New group. Networking. All right. And not there. There. Great. Okay, so let's create our server file. We'll call it server. And this is going to use a lot of the same functions that I did in my C++ version of this. So if you watch that video, a lot of this will be familiar. So let's go ahead and remove this, and let's define a struct to represent the server. So I am still using some objects here, but it's not going to be nearly as uh, ubiquitous as it was in the previous one. So struct, and let's go ahead and use our struct def. Oh, it's gone now. Oh, well. So our struct is going to be server, and this is going to require a number of different properties. So Everything that I was doing as parameters in the constructors for those objects, I'm now just going to have as member variables in this struct. So we're going to have int domain, int protocol, and int service. I'm doing these in a particular order. It's not really necessary to do that, but it's just how I remember it. So we'll have unsigned long interface. And we can see that I need a library for that, but we'll add that in a moment. And then we have int port. And I think I'm missing something. Let's check over at C++. What else did I have? So service protocol port interface and backlog. Domain port interface backlog, okay. And then we need another struct for the address of this. And this is something that we're going to pass into some of the socket functions. 
So let's go ahead and add those libraries. So include socket, and we're going to include net inet slash in dot h, and that's going to give us our unsigned long. There we go. Okay. So we're going to want our address in here. So struct sock addr, and I believe it needs to be addr in. And one thing I notice when I do that is if I type in the in, I get sock addr in six. And I'm not sure, but it seems to me like that is what is going to be used if you're using IP version six. And I'm not using IP version six, but it does make me wonder whether this particular server is going to be truly portable. If I have to specify if I'm using IPv6 versus v4, why isn't there a v5? I don't know. Anyway, if I have to specify that, then by specifying version four here, it's not necessarily going to work in all circumstances. So I'm just gonna keep that in mind. And then we are going to have a member function that is going to be for launching the server. And I want that, that way when I actually create one of these web servers, I can just say server.launch and it will do everything. But I'm not actually going to specify what it's going to do because different servers will need to do different things. That is going to be for the user to implement manually. So we're going to have a void and it's going to be a pointer to launch and it should take no parameters. And that should do it. And we'll have a constructor. That way the user can specify all these things in a single function and get a return of the server object. So we'll say struct server, server constructor. And they're gonna pass in most of these parameters. So they'll pass in int domain, int service, int protocol, u long interface int port and int backlog. From those parameters, we are going to be able to determine what the parameters in the address should be. Uh, but I also need to pass in the function. So we'll pass in a void pointer to, not a void pointer, a function, a, the name of a function here, a pointer to a function. And it's gonna be void. Okay. And that should be all that we need here in the header file. So let's open it up on the side and let's clear some space here. And let's just define our server constructor. So struct If you haven't seen this before, this right here is called a function prototype. And it essentially defines a function with all of its parameters without actually defining it. So or instantiating it, I suppose would be the word. So we say that there is a function called server constructor with all of these parameters, but we actually specify what is going to be here later. And there are some benefits to this. One is just for the organization of a file. If I put all of my constructors at the very top of the file, or not my constructors, my prototypes at the top of the file, and I realize I'm putting it at the bottom here, that's okay. If I put them all at the top of the file, then later on I could have these functions reference one another without worrying about where they are defined. So if I only have my definitions, then I have to be careful to make sure that a function A calling function B is defined after function B. But if I put a function prototype at the top of the file, then it doesn't matter where the definition of A and B are because it's already defined and then the instantiation of it happens later. So that works fine. And another reason is for just the clean cleanliness of these header files. So I don't want the definition of my server constructor here in the header file. I just want the user to know, hey, there is a server constructor file. It takes these parameters in this order and you can use it to generate a new server object. They don't need to know how that happens. They just need to know that it happens. So that's why I'm using it. So when I come over here into my header file or my implementation file, the .c file, I can reference this server constructor and actually define what it does. So let's give it its parameters, domain, service, protocol, 
interface, backlog, and a function pointer. And here we are going to first instantiate a server object. So we are going to say struct server server and we will return that server at the end. And in between, we need to actually define some of the properties of this server. So let's just use the parameters that were passed. So server dot domain equals domain, server dot service equals service. And what you can see here is in my C++ version of this, I actually gave the passed parameter a different name from the one that was in the object itself. So I might say like server or servire, <laughs> whatever that says, servire do domain. That way I can differentiate them here in the actual declaration of these things. But since I am specifying server.domain, I can have just the variable domain and it's clear enough what's going on. And I am glad that I can use the same name in both places. It just makes things a little bit cleaner. So server dot protocol equals protocol interface equals interface dot port equals port and backlog. Okay, now we need to actually create our address. So, and we want to have sign address equals the domain. And this is all the same as I was doing here in my C++ version. I'm switching over because I don't remember exactly what goes where. So <laughs> I get to show you and I get to cheat a little bit. So if we look here, I set the address sign family to domain, the sign port to port, and sign addr.sadr to interface. And so over here, I need to do the same, but I can gather those parameters from the ones that were passed into the function. So that's how I'm doing this. And what is it not like? Incompatible type. What was that? Sign family. See, I told you I didn't remember. And then we're going to say server dot address dot and what was this one again address I think that's the port yes and we're calling this function HTONS and that is just H2 network and what this is doing is essentially converting our integer port into bytes that will refer to a network port and it's a simple function that we just need to make that transition in between. So port and then server dot address dot and I believe it is sign addr dot s addr and I have this one wrong. Sign port. Let me make sure on my C++ file that I got this right because it's good to check your work. Yes, that's right. Okay. ADDR equals HTONL, which does the same thing for a long, and we are going to pass it interface, if I am correct here. That should be the only thing, hopefully, yeah, that's right, okay. Now we need to, since we have defined the parameters of this address, we can now use it to create our socket for the server. And actually the socket is something we're going to refer to a lot throughout the lifetime of this server. So it will be good to define it as a member variable for easy reference. So let's define int sock. Now let's call it socket. And we'll say server.socket equals socket. And we're going to call this function. And we are going to pass it a few members. So first is domain. And I'm forgetting again what comes in this one. So we pass it domain, service, and protocol. Pretty simple. Okay. 
And this is going to create a socket connection to the network. So a socket is what allows our operating system to communicate with the network. And it does this in a particular domain using a particular type of service. So in our case, it will end up being socket stream where it's just going to get like one character after the next and protocol. So we define all that in this function and it will basically give us a, a address for where this socket is located. And that's why we need to reference this later. But I should at this point do a check to make sure that this has actually worked. So I'm going to include the standard input output. And the reason I'm including it in this C file rather than the H file is that when someone imports this H file, they are absolutely going to need socket and they're absolutely going to need net inet, but they're not necessarily going to need the standard input output. So I will put it in this C file just to make it so that they don't actually import that into their project unless they're going to be using it. So that's why I put that there. And what I'm going to do is do a little test on this server socket connection. So if server.socket equals zero, we'll call p error, and I'm going to say failed to connect the socket. Now let's give it a new line. And then we're going to exit the program with the error code one. So one represents a failure somewhere in the program, an irregular exiting of the program. And there are a lot of different things that people use. There's a lot of different numbers you can put in here, but uh, one is the one we're after here. Zero is usually things exited fine. And for that, I need standard lib. And that should, yes, okay. So now we need to bind the socket to the network. So we're going to call another function, and this one is bind. And here we are going to pass server.socket, and then we are going to have to pass a sock address pointer. So I'm going to need to cast this address as a sock address pointer. So I'm going to say struct address pointer and the address of server dot address. And then I need to pass it the size of dot address. Okay, so this is going to bind our socket to the network. And again, I want to do a test to make sure this actually worked. So the bind function is going to do its operation and then return either one or, I think it's either zero or some negative number depending on whether it succeeded or failed. So I want to say if the result of this, so I put it in separate parentheses, if that is less than zero, and let's delete our semicolon, and I'm going to do the same thing. P error failed to bind socket, and then we'll exit again. And then I want to tell the server that it should be listening. And listening means that it is going to wait for an incoming connection on the specified port. And when it receives those, it will then do something with it. And we will define what it does in launch. So we are going to say listen. And we are going to pass this server.socket. And we are going to pass it a backlog. So if we think of this as a line, let's say I am a, a librarian handing people books. I can only hand one person a book at a time. But how many people can be lined up in front of my desk waiting for their turn? That's our backlog. And we can specify whatever backlog we want. And for this, I'm going to just use the parameter server.backlog. Now this I could do Either way, I could say server.backlog, or I could just say backlog, because backlog was a parameter that we passed into this function. But once I have actually declared what our server's backlog is, I want to use that version of it from now on. 
and I will never reference this parameter again. From now on, whenever I want any of these parameters, I'm going to reference the specific server's version. And it doesn't make a difference in the end, but it is just kind of a good practice, I find. No one ever said that it was a good practice to me, but I assume that it is one. So we are also going to run our same test on this. So we want to do that first, and then we want to see if it's less than zero because this function is also going to return a negative number if it failed, and we'll just print out an error. And then we'll exit. And there we go. Now the last thing I need to do is define our launch function. So we'll just say server.launch equals launch. Okay, so this basically creates our server object and then returns it to whoever called it. And what it does is just set all of the object parameters equal to the parameters you passed in the function. It uses those to determine the parameters of this address structure. It then will create a socket for the server. It will bind that socket and it will start listening each time checking for errors. Then it will set your launch function and it will return the server itself. So let's create an example of this to test if it actually worked. So I'm going to close both of these and let's create a little test file. Um, something went wrong there. Yeah, I tried to create a Swift file. And we don't want a header for this. Okay, so I'm going to include server.h and let's have a main function. So we're going to say struct server server equals the result of our server constructor. Now remember that we need to actually pass in our server constructor items here. So this is going to be where we specify the domain, the interface, et cetera, et cetera. So if I remember the order correctly, let's pull them up side by side so I don't have to. We are going to pass it first the domain, which is AFINET. Then we are passing the service, which is SockStream. Protocol is zero. Our interface is NADDR underscore any. Then the port we want is going to be 80 and we'll say a backlog of 10. Now we need our launch function. So I need to define that up here before I actually can reference it in this constructor. So I'm going to say void, ooh, void launch. And this is going to have a few steps to it. And in fact, it's going to be exactly the same steps as those in my test server over here in C++. So you can see I divided this up into multiple sections. And in this launch function, I'm not going to do that just because it's a little bit superfluous, but we're basically going to print waiting. We are then going to accept the socket that's trying to connect. So it is going to try to wait for someone to make a connection and make a request. And it will do that with these parameters, which I will probably need to copy over because I don't remember them offhand. <laughs> That's okay. And then we are going to do something with the connection. And then we are going to respond to the connection with something like this. So let's do all of this. What I'm going to do first is print out. Do I not have? Yeah, I have it. Print F. Okay, so we're gonna wait for a connection. And then we are going to actually get our connection. So we'll say int new socket. And I'm already seeing a problem here. So in order to accept the new socket, I need the server's socket. So I'm going to have to, in my launch function, specify that this receives a pointer to the object. If you remember when I was using my data structures, I had to pass in what I 
related to passing self in Python. I have to do that here as well. So struct server pointer server. And let's specify that over here. Okay. So our new socket is going to be the result of the accept function that comes from sys slash socket. And we are going to have to pass this server.socket. And whoa, what did I press there? We'll pass it server.socket. And let me double check what else do we need? Server.socket. Ah, yes, the address. And this is going to be the address of the actual server and then the length of it. But we need the address length to be declared up here because we can't put this function in here because of the casting that we need to do. So I am going to refer back to this because it's, a, it's quite the line of code. So our accept function is going to be our server dot, what even is that line? Uh, we are casting the address as a sock ADDR pointer. Okay, so. address of, and then size of, is that right? Except the socket itself, the address, and we actually cast that as sock len t, and that's why we actually get the size of up there. So let's say int address length equals size of server dot address and then we need to cast this here and we'll cast this as struct is that right socklin t socklin t and yeah as a pointer but it's not a struct quite an odd function call. All right, <laughs> and we'll pass it the address of address length. Okay, so that will accept our new connection. And if we were doing this in a real application, we would want to run a, another test on this to make sure that the connection succeeded. But for now, we are not going to worry about that. And after, whoa, I made a mistake there. I didn't need to do that. Okay, great. So we have accepted it. We have set the new socket equal to that. And then we need to read it. So we're going to read it from the new socket, the buffer, what we'll be putting what it requests into the buffer. And then we say what the buffer's size is. And I need to define buffer. So our buffer, let's just give it 30,000 for no particular reason. And we are going to say read new socket buffer 30,000. Okay. And then after we call this acceptor, we are then going to call the handler. And in our case, the handler is just going to print the buffer. So it's just going to say what the person was requesting. So we'll say print F buffer. And I think I need to actually say percent %s backslash n buffer because it wants a constant car or constant char array pointer. And that's not what I have up here. I just have a char array. So I need to use this percent %s to basically put a string into that. And a bit weird I have to admit in C++ I like the standard C out better it's a little cleaner maybe there's another function for C that I can use here if you know of one please let me know in the comments anyway we also need our hello message and I am just going to copy and paste this from here because I don't want to have to type all of that out and the only thing I want to change now let's yeah let's let's change it it'll be it'll be fun so instead of saying hello world Let's have it say homo deus. Okay. 
And then we are going to need to write that back to the, the socket that just connected. So we're going to pass it this, this write function. We are going to pass the new socket, hello, and the string length. And then we're going to close the new socket. So write new socket, hello, uh, is, is that string length? Yes, so we're going to need string.h. And once we write that, we need sterling. And it's hello. Is that correct? Yes, it is. And then we just close the new socket. OK. And then we can pass our constructor, our launch function. And then we can, at the end, now that we have the instance of server that references all of these specific things, we can now say server dot launch and pass it the address of server. Okay, so if I compile and run this, we'll see if it actually works. So we are going to run, give me a moment here, I'm gonna type it out without having to, let's see, is that all correct? Yes, okay, so I was experimenting this with this last night. I do several rough drafts of these before I actually come on, so, even though I don't have the actual, uh, <laughs> this whole process memorized, I have actually prepared for this video. So yeah, I can't say I did not put my work in. So I'm gonna use GCC to compile this whole thing and we are needing to include all of these .c files. So let's do that. Oh yeah, it never works the first time. And yes, okay. I believe it is the same problem except for this one. There's a library I'm missing. That's okay. So let's first go in, let's close our C++ file. We don't need that anymore. And this is passing a pointer and I tried to use the dot accessor and I need the arrow. So we'll change all of those. Don't do that anywhere else. Okay, let's save that and check our new error output. Uh, yes, I'm still doing it somewhere except there it is honestly i'd rather have the compiler just tell me where these things are so address length ah yes i spelled it wrong let's see if i build this will it just tell me where these errors are yes okay read and write and close so i need to actually get the library that includes those so I need, I think it's net inet slash in dot h. Is that right? Let's try it building again. No. What, where exactly does that come from? Uni S standard. Okay. go uh, and over here server.h I didn't specify somewhere not void but and then let me check the actual constructor did I change that here no That should be right. There we go, build succeeded. Okay, if you're wondering why my builds are succeeding over here in Xcode, but it's not actually doing anything with my test files, it's because this project is a library, not an actual executable. So the end product is this static.a file, which makes it really easy to Im include in your projects. If I copy and paste this libhdelibc.a, into the top level directory along with all of the header files into some other project, then I don't need a compile string this long. I can just say gcc test.c and then lib hde lib c.a and it will just include all of it. So that's why I'm doing that. But for now, I'm not using that. Let's just go ahead and compile that. So far, so good. So we'll dot slash a dot out and nothing. 
<laughs> Interesting. Why nothing? I suppose one thing I forgot is that this needs to be an infinite loop. So while one, let's get rid of this. And let's indent all of these gentlemen. There we go. Should be good. So let's compile and run. Why is it not doing anything? Hmm. Okay. Debugging time. So one of the best ways to do debugging is to use print statements so we can see where it's actually failing. So what I'm going to do, I know it's entering this main function and let's see if it's calling the constructor or if it's calling launch. And we'll basically just use printf1 and let's put a backslash n for a new line. And then we'll say printf2. We will compile 1, 2. Okay, so it's in the launch function that it fails. Okay, why does it fail in the launch function? So let's see if it gets to the while loop. And let's do this. Seems unlikely because it's not printing out the waiting, so why would it print any of those out? One, two, three, four. Okay, so it gets to here. Why does it not print this one? Let's do this. Does not get to five, okay. So what if I just take out this buffer here? And let's say I define it right here instead. So what I'm thinking there is that this while loop is constantly trying to declare a new variable buffer of size 30,000. And 30,000 bytes is quite a lot of memory, not in the grand scheme of things. I mean, I have gigabytes of memory, but still doing that in this infinite loop, that is probably fairly cumbersome. So let's see how this works now. Okay, it still gets to four. Well, that's peculiar. Why wouldn't it print five? You see, it's getting to line 19 and then stopping. That's pretty bizarre. Got to five. Now it's not going here, so let's put in our Okay, okay, well, I suppose it's waiting for a connection after all. So let's see, if I pull that up, there we go, homo deus, we have our web server working. Um, but it's not actually printing out the buffer. Why is it not printing out the buffer? You see, it's interesting. Okay, well, let's, let's take this and define that up here. That way we're not defining a variable in the actual loop. And let's do the same thing with address length. And let's do the same with new socket. And that way we can just say new socket there. So what I'm thinking here is just, if, if you think of the scope of it, I don't need a new copy of any of these variables every single time I run this loop. So I declare it in the scope that contains the loop. That way it gets declared once and then just referenced from then on. So let's 
close this. Okay. Refresh. Can't open the page. But it's giving me the connection. And it seems like this is actually working. And the, yeah, it can't parse response. So if I change this back to, let's see, where is it? Instead of homo deus, the reason this is going to make a difference is this statement right here. It tells us the length of the content that it's sending. And if it does not match exactly, so this is exactly 88 units in length. I don't know if that's actual characters. I can count it, but I'm not going to. It has to be exactly that length. Otherwise, the, the client doesn't necessarily like it. So let's try this one more time. Hello world, homo deus. Okay, so that's pretty interesting. Um, what is it, command option E? So that's because of my cache. So my Safari web browser remembers, oh, I was just on this website and here was the content. I'm just gonna hand it to you. But the content has since changed. So I need to empty my cache, and if I refresh it again, let me see now it can't parse the response. Very interesting. You can see that I am getting my connections. Why does it not like it? So let's take... Okay, so another fun thing about these HTTP responses is that you need an additional blank line. So if I run this, and that separates our header, so from here to here, and then we have a blank space, and then we have the actual body of the response. So the response takes on at least two things in this circumstance, that is an HTTP server. So if we run it, and if I refresh, we should get, still not liking it. Let's try. Nope, doesn't like it. What doesn't it like? It's interesting because my connections are coming in. And while we're at it, let's go ahead and delete our prints. Okay, so what does it not like here? What if I take out the close statement? That's probably a bad idea. So if I take that out, then it won't ever close this incoming connection. But I'm wondering if that's causing the problem. Let's see over here. Yeah, okay, so I've gotten this connection and it takes its time loading. Let's retry it, just harass it a little bit. Sometimes it occurs when the server is busy. It's hard to tell because now I'm using this Safari web browser, which may be wanting some specific things that I am not giving it. So, it's hard to say exactly what the problem is here. What is most important about this is that I can see that it's working on the back end. So if I just run this, a dot out, oh, address already in use. Okay, I'm gonna have to wait a few minutes because the server is currently, it's the, the fact that it is no longer bound or listening to that particular port means that it's, I just need to wait. We've waited long enough, it seems. Okay, so if I come back here and let's type it in again. Yeah, it says it can't respond, but it is actually saying that the connection was made. I don't know if you saw that pop up right there. Look at this. It says that I was <laughs> using a screen for 19 hours and 35 minutes a day last week. I definitely wasn't. So... I sleep at least eight hours a night, so I don't know why it's saying that. So give me a few minutes here. I'm going to experiment with getting this thing to work. Maybe if I 
clear the cache again. Will that do anything? No. What if I change it back to Homo Deus? I don't think that'll do anything. That'd be silly. Okay, we're gonna have to wait. Okay, so I got it running again. And what we can see here is I have changed the hello message to just have the homo deus. And let's see, what else did I change here? I took out the actual size of it. So by not specifying a size at all, you can see that when I refresh it, it works. So just changing the header. It seems that this HTTP header up until here is rather finicky and having a date in there of what the current date is and having the content length, it seems to cause some problems. So when I actually use this server, I need to keep that in mind. But none of this launch sequence is actually what I am interested in for this particular part of the project. What I wanted was this. I want a server object where I can just put in all of the parameters I want at once We'll do all this backend stuff for me. I can just tell it to launch and create a function to tell it to what, what to do when it launches, and I will have a server running. Now, anytime I want a server, I can just call that function, and I am good to go. So we have created a server object here in C. It's much simpler than my server object was in C++, and I am going to do some tests to actually check the performance of this, but that will be in a future video. So as always, thank you for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope you learned something. And if you feel inclined, feel free to subscribe, hit the bell, like the video, all of that great stuff. Thank you for watching. Toodaloo.